G'day, mate. Luke Ford here. Thought I'd do a stream about my dad. I'm struck that uh, just depending on the angle I take, my, my father looks completely different. So if I look at him from this angle, he seems heroic, seems like the greatest guy in the world. He seems courageous, uh, a warrior for God, uh, someone who has sacrificed himself for the, for the good of other people. And then if I look at him from a different angle, I think, oh, the guy was emotionally crippled. He was uh, addicted to controversy and to provoking people. Uh, he would just tear communities apart. So it all depends on the, the angle that I take when I look at my dad, whether I, I admire him or if I... And so sometimes I do. I look at this angle and I think of all the things I admire about my father. Then I look from this angle and I think about, okay, here are all the ways that I don't want to be anything like my father. I remember I had a therapist who said, from basing her statement from things I'd said, that uh, I would not want your father's life for all the tea in China. I just told her that I felt like I was repeating my father's life. And... I know there are a lot of people who love me and a lot of people who hate me. And again, it's probably just the slightly different angle that they take and it can make all the difference. Uh, part of me wants to think about my dad as a hero. My dad is a great man. So that uh, perhaps some of that can, can rub off on me. It, it, wouldn't it be more awesome to be the, the son of a, a great man than the, the son of an emotional cripple? There were, there were times when I tried to leverage <laughs> uh, that I was Desmond Ford's son. I remember I got my first job basically leveraging that I was Desmond Ford's son. So I got a job as a gardener in sixth grade. And I did a less than mediocre job and got fired after a few months. And uh, the lady doctor who fired me uh, felt that she had to come round to our home and talk to my parents and I about why I'd been let go. Wow, I wonder what just fell back there. That was embarrassing. Another time uh, when, when it was Good News Unlimited, my father had set up his own non-denominational uh, evangelical Christian foundation. And something like 1982, they needed, uh, they needed some help to, to get this mailing out. So I showed up. And I just kept showing up every day because I, I wanted a job. <laughs> and they didn't expect me to come back. Like, they were shocked. But they, they tried to accommodate me for a few months, and then <laughs> and they, and they let me go. And also in ninth, tenth grade, I started a newsletter, mainly tried to sell my father's friends on subscribing to a newsletter where I keep them up to date with what my dad was doing. And so I, I sold subscriptions to my own newsletter. Uh, it wasn't much of a success. And my father was kind of embarrassed because he saw what I was doing, that I was trying to leverage my connections with him to sell my, my newsletter. <laughs> uh, I, I always had the sense that my father saw me more accurately than I saw myself. I usually had the sense that my father saw life more accurately than I understood life. I always had the sense that when I'd argue with my father that he always won. And uh, up until the moment I knew he was dead, uh, I always feared my father, which I don't think is necessarily unhealthy. Uh, I mean, it's part of, of respect, right? That there's, there's fear. But uh, if I hear a creak in the floorboards, Sometimes it reminds me of my father that he's going to come to my room and reprimand me. So uh, if I ever saw my father hurrying towards me, it was, it was really good news. <laughs> it usually meant that I'd done something wrong and that I was about to uh, get, uh, get a reprimand. So a few years ago, I got a cup, co copy of my mother's testament of faith. So Gwen Ford, she, she died at about age 40, uh, just before I turned three. So she wrote her testament of faith. 
and it was published in the Australian Record, a Seventh-day Adventist publication, January 1972. She would have composed this in early 1971. She died in April of 1971. This lump will have to come out, the doctor said kindly. My mind raced. This little lump, I thought, why? It's not much bigger than a pea, and I feel so well, surely there can be nothing wrong. The doctor continued, if it is malignant, the whole breast will have to come off. I walked from the doctor's office stunned. Next came breaking the news to my husband, and later still to tell our eight-year-old daughter and six-year-old son of my need to go to the hospital. The lump proved malignant. Was God taken by surprise? Was this affliction just my luck, something over which God, the God of the sparrows, had no control? So uh, my mother had a mastectomy, I think, removed one breast because of breast cancer. This was before I was born, before she was even pregnant with me. And uh, I'm reading this because use what language you will, you can never say anything but what you are. So by reconnecting to my mother's writings, I am reconnecting to my mother. She writes, during my hospitalization that I had or had had cancer could not make me dismal for more than a moment. So close and real was the presence of Christ. Instead, my life seemed filled with blessings. I left the hospital rejoicing, never doubting that cancer for me was finished forever. But then two and a half years later came vomiting, consistent and persistent and uncontrollable. So this was the night of my first birthday. There were hospital tests, plenty of them. And then after weeks, the verdict, it was bone cancer in the ribs and hips and spine. There was no known cure. My husband broke the news to me through a Bible reading. She used the spirit of God to take away shock and fear. Two years have come and gone since then, and I would not care to contemplate the details of that time. It is like looking back upon a nightmare. There have been months of hospitalization, months upon months of separation from husband and family, as several nursing friends in distant places endeavored to bring me back to health. Mostly, it has meant confinement to bed, inability to walk, pain, innumerable vomitings, and consequent reduction to virtually a skeleton. Several times, death seems certain. So, my mother was about five foot two, and she dropped down to about 60 pounds. Had God forsaken me? No, I could truly say he was a God who comforteth us in all our tribulations. Had not his own beloved son gone through agony worse than mine, and the father had suffered with the son. God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. I knew that God was not unmindful of my plight. His life, his presence, his strength brought comfort in the valley of the shadow. The prayers offered by my bedside, especially when I was too ill to pray myself, and the consciousness of other prayers by friends and loved ones, then distant, brought comfort and assurance. How precious the promises of God's word when all else is unavailing. So I'm just reading from uh, my mother's uh, final testimony. Okay, and I've put a link to this in the video description. The Lord's presence and the promises from his words can buoy us up and help us through experiences which otherwise we would not be able to endure. My husband and I were sustained by these leaves from the tree of life through innumerable crises. So my father would write books and preach sermons on how not to worry. And yet you just look at his face and it was just lined with worry. So my, I remember explaining this once in a writing class I was taking. And so my, my teacher said, ah, so your father was the, the wounded healer. Such an experience as has befallen me need not be all loss. In health, we are so prone to rely upon ourselves and our own powers to achieve and not to realize how useless our human efforts really are without God. Stripped of my ability to walk and work, I'm constantly thrown upon d the divine power. So one of the final things that my mother did was to line up the second Mrs. Ford. And so my mother helped to choose my father's secretary, who became my stepmother. And so the three of them would often go walking. So Jill, my stepmother, would often be, be pushing... Uh, Gwen in the wheelchair, 
or my dad would push it and the three of them would, would walk on the beach. And then uh, sometimes uh, dad and Jill would go for a little walk and just leave Gwen in the wheelchair. And when, when they come back, she'd be crying. Gwen would be crying. My mother would be crying. I mean, just imagine sitting there watching your husband walk off with your future wife, even though this is what my mother wanted. When my death comes, it will not be a tragedy, a cutting off an untimely event, but a full fruition of the Lord's plan for my life. Life still can be full of challenge and interest, even for the invalid. Resources before untapped and now opened up with so much apparently gone. I appreciate better and find how very much more is really left. What would I exchange for sight and the ability to think and talk? The family takes on a new preciousness after all the separation, a sunny morning, the scenes of nature all mean more to me now. So I didn't spend much time with my mother in her final two years of life. So I was off in New Zealand when she died. Uh, I was staying with friends and relatives and acquaintances of the family during the years of her illness. When illness came, I found friends springing up everywhere. Their prayers and kindness brought cheer and comfort to the sickbed. If family and friends could be so kind, how much more our Heavenly Father, whose goodness we so faintly mirror. So my bro father's brother was an atheist, Val, and he stopped talking to my father. I think he even threatened to kill him when my father decided to go to Avondale College to train to be a Seventh-day Adventist minister. So my father and his brother had no contact for about 20 years. And then when Val, my dad's brother, heard that uh, my mother was had, had cancer, then he, he got back in touch and they remained close ever since then. What then of the future? Medically speaking, the bone cancer is expected to spread until finally the liver or lungs are affected and the end is hastened. If this is the Lord's will for me, I can await it without dread and say, Ebenezer, hitherto hath the Lord helped me. I fully believe the Lord will use this sickness for his glory and that through it he will cause more good than could be accomplished by a lifetime of labor. We are a theater unto men and to angels. And again, all these things happen to them for examples. The Lord has sustained me in a wonderful way, and I now know that his grace is sufficient for our every trial. So much so that from the time over two years ago, so I write this, that I knew I had secondary inoperable cancer, a terminal case. All concern of it has been lifted from me. That I have cancer has not caused me the least shudder, nor even made me think on it for more than two minutes at a time. The prayers of God's people, while not affecting a miracle of healing, have done something much greater. They have kept me in perfect peace, and through God's grace, I've been able to bear much suffering. I feel awed, grateful, and rich when I consider what the Lord has done for me. The Lord has given me this message and a wonderful husband and turned my life into a heaven. Mm. That's my mother's final testament. So my, my father's final testament was about how he has devoted his life to seeking theological truth. That he's always stood up for theological truth, uh, no matter the price. So, a little, little different, uh, his testimony from my mother's. His is much more about uh, his life's work, as you would expect. And my mother's testimony was much more about her relationship with God. So my father was a controversial figure in the Seventh-day Adventist church. There are three types of Seventh-day Adventists. There are the traditional ones who believe uh, very strongly in very detailed prophecies about the end of the world and the distinctiveness of the Adventist message. Then there are the liberal Adventists who are just in it for the lifestyle. And then there are the evangelical Christian Adventists who feel great camaraderie with other evangelicals. So. I'll play a little bit now from a critique of my father by Norman McNulty. He is a traditional Adventist critiquing my father, the evangelical Adventist. The crowd loved every word, greeting Ford's message with enthusiastic applause. At least one retired North American division president was there, rising to his feet during the question period with a choked voice and a breaking heart. 
A group of us gathered in the back after the meeting, hardly believing what we had just heard. Upon returning to my dorm room, I called Herbert Douglas again, as I had promised to do in the event Ford's message was newsworthy. I read him my notes over the telephone. By the so this refers to a speech my father gave in October of 1979, where he disagreed with the foundational heavenly sanctuary doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So it's not easy to belong to a group when you publicly uh, disparage, disagree with, take the legs out from under the foundational doctrine of that group. So that's what this uh, is referring to. By the time I finished, a sorrow was palpable. Tapes of the meeting belt of the world in days. Soon the General Conference intervened, arranging with Pacific Union College that Ford be given a six-month leave of absence, during which time he would prepare a de defense of his views, which would then be examined by a committee of persons from varied backgrounds. Ford's manuscript titled Daniel 8.14, The Day of Atonement and the Investigative Judgment, totaled 991 pages and was eventually published in book form. And then he goes on to say, a group of 114 scholars, pastors, and church administrators, soon to be called the Sanctuary Review Committee, met to consider Ford's case at the Glacier View Ranch near Ward, Colorado, the week of August 10 to 15, 1980. Less than a month later, following unsuccessful efforts by church leaders to urge Ford's reconsideration of his stand, the General Conference recommended to the Australasian Division that Ford's ministerial credentials be removed. This was done. The years that followed would see scores of pastors and a number of congregations exit the ministry as well as the de denomination. And the controversy thus ignited continues to this day. It is an epic the church dare not forget and one whose unfinished business remains essential to the task of contemporary Adventism. You know, <clears throat> reading that account, you know, it's, it's almost hard for me to to get through that account with being emotional because there you see Adventism nearly destroyed by one person. But it started with the fruits of questions on doctrine. And you say, well, well, how did that happen? Well, first I want to read a quote from Maranatha, page 45. So I'm going through my dad's uh, emails to me over the years. Wouldn't be that many, but uh, here's a typical one, August 22nd from 2011. Dear Luke, we are sorry the going is so tough for the for you. Nevertheless, your email gave us joy. It sounded like a different Luke. So this is after I think I told them this is after I told them I joined a 12-step program for sex addiction. You are well aware that stocks are crumbling around the world, and our only income is from a small investment in stocks. How we will survive, we do not know, but trust in God. He will help you for he loves you. Praying for you most earnestly and with much love, Dad. So that's uh, a quintessential, uh, quintessential uh, email from my father. And uh, occasionally, I'd send Dad a link to something I thought he might find interesting, and this is how he typically respond: "Luke, thank you, kind of you to send it. Very interesting indeed. Love, Dad." Then. Uh, Another time. Thank you, Luke. I appreciate the article and you're sending it important. Glad your new career is working well. Much love to you, Dad. And uh, uh, I wish my dad a happy birthday. He responds, thanks, Luke. Sorry you've been tormented by the flu, but I'm glad you say that it is departing. Much love to you, Dad. So pretty much all my father's messages could have been sent by a, a robot. Uh, but on the other hand, if I'd been a little different, then uh, perhaps I could have enjoyed the... Uh, a wonderful relationship with my dad. Many, many people did, but uh, maybe you know much of that was on me. So certainly, my sister ha always had a wonderful relationship with my dad. Is I sent it, my dad another another link, uh, and he responds, "Luke, thank you for your good news and greetings. May your days get brighter and brighter. Much love to you, Dad."
And then uh, a little while later, I'm not sure you'll be interested. Here are three articles on chronic fatigue syndrome. We admire you for your courage in dealing with this malady. As Churchill said on another matter, never give up. Hope all else is well with you, including your employment. Much love to you, Dad. And, uh, thanks, Luke. Hope you're winning in your battle for health. Love, Dad. And uh, another time, so I had had a friend who's 16 year old was just starting to drive and it made me remember what a what a very patient teacher my father was that uh, once i was learning to drive and i was driving his home from church and uh, i saw this oncoming motorcycle but i thought i could turn left in front of him but i had misjudged and so he had to take his motorcycle to the ground uh, he was a little shaken up and uh uh, I remember he had, he was an old man and he had all these like nudie mags <laughs> on the back of his bike. And, uh, my father like reached into his pocket and like pulled out about $200 and put it in the, in the guy's, uh, put it in the guy's hand. And then, uh, my, my mom insisted that, uh, I get back in the car and drive off with, with my parents in the car, obviously. So one of the things that my father told me about driving is that you're very unlikely to die in a car if you're driving under 35 miles an hour. I remember passing that on to someone who was learning to drive. So uh, my brother would call my father Dr. Dr. Deathman because he was very obsessed with, uh, with life. And then my father was always interested in diet, preventative health. So I sent him an article that said, uh, what's a reasonable diet? Walk into a cafeteria, look at all the people you don't want to look like, see what's on their plate and how much and don't eat like that. Now look at all the people you want to look like, see what is on their plate and eat that way. And my dad responds, thank you, Luke, for that splendid article, which you summed up in a few pregnant lines. Hope you are doing better and no heartburn. Love, Dad. And uh, and I responded uh, very slowly and erratically getting better. Found myself giggling last night for the first time in about three months. So, yes, I'm on the mend. And, uh, and then in that thread, I, I emailed someone. I never had a sense that my dad wanted to know me. I assume you felt the same way. I had very little sense that dad wanted to know anyone. He really seemed interested in people. My father would often counsel people, and I'd hear him uh, counseling them in the living room when I was in my room. And I was always struck by he gave people really good advice. It wasn't just uh, by the numbers religious advice, but uh, I was always struck by that. So uh, November 7, 2013, I told dad I took some magnesium on an empty stomach before bed. The last two nights had the best sleep in months. And uh, my dad responds, Luke, I'm a bit of an insomniac myself. So glad you have found a cure of blessings, dad. Then uh, I sent uh, my dad a, a graph about uh, the mean IQ of white college graduates. In the 1960s, it was 113.7. In the 1970s, it was 110.6. In the 1980s, it was 108. In the 1990s, 104.4. And in the 2000s, 105.1. So I sent it off to dad, said, I thought this would amuse you. My father responded, yes, Luke, thank you. Hope you're getting stronger. Praying for you always. Love, dad. I responded, I am getting stronger. I biked three miles yesterday. My dad responds, splendid. So my father would tell me that when he came to America to teach, that he had to give half as much homework as he gave to his students in Australia. 
because in comparison to Australian students, you found American ones uh, much less serious, much less capable. Because in Australia, historically, only about 5% uh, of the population would go on to university, while in America, about 40, 50% of the population goes on to some tertiary education. So I told uh, Dad that I've been watching this Australian TV show, The Straits, set in Cairns and Papua New Guinea in northern uh, Queensland. So it made me homesick, gorgeous photography. They use the slang going tropo for tropical, really meaning black, aka violent, impetuous, and low IQ decision making. Then my, my father responds, sorry to hear about your flu, Luke. There are many ways of measuring IQ and they do not agree. Love, Dad. And uh, then, then I, I responded, uh, have you ever been to Papua New Guinea? It sounds terribly violent and dangerous and backward. Or have you visited any of the Torres Strait Islands on TV? They look like paradise. My dad responds, no, not yet, but things are not always what they seem. I hope you continue to improve in body and mind. And then someone else in my family responds, no, I've not visited Papua New Guinea or the Torres Strait Islands. The cost to fly to any of the islands in the Torres Strait would be more than to fly to Los Angeles. Papua New Guinea is too dangerous for white, for white guys, but looks interesting. Then I sent my dad letter uh, an, e an article on helicopter parenting and uh, send, uh, said uh, we were lucky we never had this helicopter parenting disabling today's kids in the usa my father responded thank you luke yes you were blessed and so were your parents love dad i had a boss 2013 has said everybody on the floor likes you but you don't care when you're included you don't care but when you're excluded that you care about there's no upside for you, only downside. When I invite you to something, you don't care. But if I don't invite you, you're all wounded. <laughs> My father responded, may you ever be open to providential wisdom. Then uh, I sent my dad a YouTube link where a therapist says, every homosexual man I've known was abandoned by his father. You will not meet a homosexual man who was close with his father. Everyone I've known was enmeshed with a woman, be it a grandma or a whole house of women. During adolescence, everyone is twisted up in everyone's sexuality and they hunger for male love and they over-identify with the feminine. My father responded, Luke, there are many theories. I think the one you quote has the most going for it, but it does not have to mean abandoned. It can mean weak, overshadowed by the wife. So I sent uh, my father, uh, yeah, I'd send him an email every, every month or two, every time I saw something interesting. Uh, I told him in 2014, I finally got health insurance. He responds, so glad, don't overdo the exercise. Temperance is not a Ford virtue, love dad. I'd tell him when I got a new car, he'd thank me for the good news. Okay. I uh, told dad about my Fisher Wallace device. It's an electrical stimulation device that helps, helps you sleep, helps to reduce anxiety and depression. My father responded, I'm glad you found something that worked. Praise the Lord. Faith and trust is the best agent of all. Much love to you, Dad. And then I wrote, Dad, uh, I'm curious if morality and conscience require the ability for abstract thought, i.e. an IQ north of 90. The higher the IQ, for instance, the more clearly a person can recall the past and see into the future, to therefore have loyalty and gratitude to use the subjunctive, if everyone does what I'm about to do, the world will be a better or worse place. 
and see the benefits of cooperation. Lower IQ people, therefore, are less likely to have a developed conscience and deserve much closer minding. And I send along an essay from American Renaissance. Father responded, I think what you have written is true. So, yeah, going through my uh, final emails with my father, let's get back to Norma McNulty speaking about the Desmond Ford apostasy. And she says, God will arouse his people. If other means fail, heresies will come in among them, which will sift them, separating the chaff from the wheat. The Lord calls upon all who believe his word to awake out of sleep. Precious light has come appropriate for this time. So you notice what she says there, heresies will come in to sift the chaff from the wheat. And this certainly would qualify. And I'm going to read to you <clears throat> 10 key points that Desmond Ford put in his his defense of his beliefs. And um, we'll, we'll just point out a couple of, of areas. Let's, let's see how we're doing on time. We, we have some time here. So number one, these are the points Desmond Ford made. <clears throat> number one, <clears throat> the focus of the judgment and sanctuary cleansing in Daniel 7 and 8 is not the people of God, but their enemies. So he's saying, you know, the judgment in Daniel 7, the cleansing of the sanctuary in Daniel 8 is because of the enemies of God, not because of God's people. And that um, that can be countered. I, we won't look up the verses now, but if you look at Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 and, and 2 and Revelation chapter 3, verse 5, it talks about God's people will be found written in the book. So I went back to see my father the final time in May of 2014. So it was my 48th birthday, last time I'd see my dad. And I remember the last time I was with him, all I could think about was that I wasn't getting uh, Wi-Fi on my phone. Uh, that's what I was obsessed with, my final moments with my dad and then driving away from my dad. So my father passed about two months ago at the age of 90. And uh, he emailed me back when I got home. So glad you were safely back home. Thank you for coming. It was lovely to see you. Blessings, Dad. And uh, a couple of weeks later, Luke, we still bask in the warm glow of the happy days with you. Thank you for coming. Then my father emailed, I was traveling with a very fine doctor of white experience yesterday told me that he dealt with many chronic fatigue patients and he could heal about one third of them by what is known as a fecal transplant. A very simple procedure. Do look into it. I pray it will help you. Love, Dad. Never gotten a fecal transplant. Press 1 in the chat if you've ever gotten a fecal transplant. What was, what was your mileage? And then my father followed up. Luke, uh, please consider the treatment for CFS. I mentioned it could change your life. I remember mentioning to you the view of some scientists that sun exposure can give strength to muscles as though exercising. Should have mentioned that if you sunbake while using refined oils, you can get skin cancer. All processed oils are bad. Much love to you, Dad. Then uh, he sent me an article on the healing mind, how neurofeedback is healing trauma. So, yeah, just going through my my dad's uh, final emails to me. Back to Norman McNulty right. here. Michael stands up at the close of probation and God's people are found written in the book, which clearly shows that God's people are a subject of the judgment. Um, so that's the first thing Desmond Ford points out. Number two, he says the year-day principle lacks clear biblical support. I mean, that's pretty pathetic. If you look at the 70 weeks, I mean, Christ came right on time. According to so my sister wanted to arrange for my dad to get Alexander Technique lessons. So my sister emails my dad. Uh, Luke suggested I find an Alexander Technique teacher. As he says, your voice box is under stress because of your posture. And I don't think my dad ever got around to having Alexander Technique lesson. It usually doesn't work to try to teach your own family because 
emotional baggage gets in the way. Oh, so I was trying to talk my dad into getting checked out for sleep apnea. People have been talking to him about that for 20 years, and he always refused because he thought only fat people would get sleep apnea. Well, when he finally did get tested in 2015, it turned out he had severe sleep apnea. But uh, the, the best solution for that is a CPAP device, but he didn't really want to use it because if he used it and it improved his life, then I don't think he could live with the with the shame of 20 years of denying a suggestion from people. I think my father would rather die than ever admit he was wrong. So it's kind of a quintessential episode. He finally got tested for sleep apnea 2015. He had severe sleep apnea, but uh, he couldn't deal with the CPAP and he'd rather die than admit that something that people have been talking to him about for 20 plus years was uh, might have might have helped him. I kind of identify with that too. Sometimes like the pain in admitting that other people were right, uh, that I've been wrong for a long, long, long time, the pain and the shame, the shame, I think, is just so overwhelming that uh, it's hard to admit and hard to make the change. So April 22nd, 2015, I emailed dad, it's mom's birthday. And he responded, you had a wonderful mother. Hope all is well with you, love dad. Okay, wow. So this is the, I think this is the last substantial email I got from my dad, May 8, 2015. Dear Luke, we do hope things are going well for you. I think and pray often for you because I love you. Not only do I love you, I respect you because you have shown great coverage over many years in the face of apparently insuperable problems. Only you know the thousands of hours of confusion, even bewilderment, pain, and uncertainty you have experienced and survived with your chronic fatigue syndrome. Well done. God has a purpose for your life if you give him your heart and your will. He can bring you the physical healing for which we have earnestly prayed. There is no need to answer this letter except to yourself. And I did not answer it. God has given you an excellent mind and you have found a refuge in Orthodox Judaism. But over all the years to come, there may be certain questions which will keep coming to you until you answer them. Here they are. Judaism had a prolonged history of rebellion prior to 605 BC. It was warned that if they did not repent, Jerusalem and the temple would be destroyed. They did not repent and these things happened. They had rejected God's warnings through his prophets and paid a terrible price. 600 years later came another professing prophet, and him they delivered to the Roman governor, saying, We want not this man but Barabbas. Crucify him. His blood be on us and on our children. And Pilate did as they wished. And 40, the biblical symbol of probationary time, 40 years later the temple and Jerusalem were destroyed, as in 605 BC, and the nation enslaved and scattered, and from that tragedy they have never been redeemed. Yet time after time in the Old Testament, God did redeem his people from their oppressors. Why not in the last 2,000 years? What mistake had they made? What sin that brought such awful pain and loss had they rejected another prophet specially sent them? Why has Israel had no prophet for over 2,000 years now? God sent prophets repeatedly for about 1,000 years. Why none now? Why have the Jews hated and rejected the only Jew who kept the law of Moses perfectly? I am very familiar with the texts used by Orthodox Jews to prove that Christ could not have been the Messiah. Texts are taken which cover both Advents, and those belonging to the second set seem to nullify the possibility of Christ being the Messiah. But they have yet to be fulfilled by the second Advent, and they do not deny Jesus of Nazareth. I hope you are not offended by my questions. You know I have not nagged you about Judaism since you adopted it. But I feel for you, and I see the possibilities your life holds if you think clearly on these matters. You may yet write a very great book, not about sex and violence, but about truth. With my warmest love to you and my prayers for you, Dad. P.S. I have repeatedly over the last 70 years seen the hand of God in my life. I long to see the same in your life. And uh, the subject line was just the letter U.
So just before uh, my 49th birthday, my dad emailed, Dear Lou, can't believe you're getting older, but the evidence is against me. Not many more years and you'll be the age I was at Glacier View, where you were also present. Remember, you chatted with one or more of the men there. You said you were the son of the heretic. Well, that same heretic has hundreds of good friends around the world, so it's okay. But this note is about you. Wishing you a great day and great health. When you were born, we had the conviction you had a special part to play for God. I st <laughs> Whoa. I still have that conviction. You're constantly in our prayers, and we love you. Happy birthday, Dad. Hmm. Then uh, about a month later, my uh, I emailed my father. It sounded like you had a major ordeal coming up with your teeth. You had all his teeth removed, and it almost killed him in June, July 2015. And my father emailed back, Thank you, Luke. So sorry to hear of your repeated health crises. Perhaps as you grow older, these will cease. I pray so, love, Dad. So I sent him that email for Father's Day. And then after he got out of the hospital, uh, I emailed him, hope you're doing okay. I've never had to endure anything as trying as what you are going through right now, Dad. You're in my thoughts and prayers. What a living nightmare. God spare me from such a trial. Love, Luke. Dad responds, thank you, Luke. Very kind. Hope you never have any hospitalization, but God has been very kind to me. I hope you're doing well. I love to you, Dad. I sent my father that uh, debate of those two black girls who were the debate champions, that, that five-minute video, and I said, the PhD in rhetoric will enjoy this video. I don't think he ever watched it. <laughs> Just responds, many thanks, Luke. Blessings, Des. Okay, I got an email here from a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. I was just doing some research on the whole Desmond Ford controversy that transpired years ago, and I'm not sure how it affected you, probably in a bad way. And on behalf of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, I wanted to apologize if you've been hurt in any way from the Adventist Church. So I'll play a little bit more from Norman McNulty on the Desmond Ford apostasy. Um, if you read some of his later works, he tries to say, well, you can't prove that Christ was baptized in 27 or died in 31 and Stephen was stoned in 34. Where's the historical evidence? Well, anyway, he's, he's picking at straws. And so he's clearly trying to destroy Adventist theology. Then in his number three point, the word cleansed. I remember emailing my father at the end of 2015 uh, kind of a tongue-in-cheek email. I'm not sure he got the tongue-in-cheek aspect of it, but I think I said in essence, oh, I found I've got a new malady. I've got maladaptive daydreaming. And my dad took it literally and seriously and he responded, Luke, thank you for sharing regarding daydreaming, but remember the psychiatrist who warned of the risk of turning normal gifts into diseases. Most folks think you are very normal and very gifted. Beware too of Prozac. They're all dangerous. Fluvo or Prozac. Turn your daydreams into books that improve the world. We love you and God loves you. You have battles of plenty, especially with sickness, but one in every five people has chronic pain. Find your strength where King David found his. Read the Psalms often. Blessings, Dad. Yeah, I'm not big into reading Tehillim, the Psalms, but my father would all the time. So every birthday, I would email my father. And, uh, okay, let's play more. Daniel 8.14 is not a correct translation. And if you actually look at the translation of it, it means to justify. It's from the Hebrew word nizdak. And, of course, since he has 
Oh, my father uh, emailed me uh, 2016. So glad you have a new job. Take care of your health. You have a Ford motor, not a Toyota. <laughs> that means that uh, I need to fix or repair myself daily. <laughs> Unlike those, those quality Toyota motors. Narrow view or the incomplete view of what justification means. If the word justified is synonymous with cleansing, and you think that just being justified is an outward process only, you wouldn't see a connection between being cleansed. Where and then uh, my father emails me November 26, 2016. Dear Luke, I do not write you often. I leave that to mum. I cannot well cope with all my duties on the net. But you are in our prayers every day, and I'm proud of the courage you have manifested these many years. May Yahweh bless and keep you always, Dad. If you understand that to be justified means to be made righteous, not just to be declared righteous, then there's no problem with that translation. Um, for mainly because when the sins of God's people are blotted out at the end of the investigative judgment, that's the final justification of God. So when I turned uh, 51, my father emailed me, Luke, happy birthday and many more. I hope you're well. Love, Dad. Psalm 139. people obviously doesn't afford to understand that now he starts to get into some weak areas number four he says antiochus epiphanes was the primary if not exclusive fulfillment of the little horn prophecy in daniel 7 and 8 i mean give me a break i mean you go to daniel 8 the little horn gets um bigger and waxes stronger than the powers that come before it and antiochus epiphanes which was a much smaller power than Medo persia and greece and Anyway, that hardly bears even talking about. Yeah, it's Catholic theology. Number five, the book of Hebrews teaches that Christ entered the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary at his ascension. And Desmond Ford used... So I installed my own portable air conditioner in July of 2018 and emailed my dad about it. And he replied, well done, mechanic. I could not have done it. Love, dad. Also emailed him when I paid off all my credit card debt in May of 2018 and got another congrats from my dad. International version to prove this. <clears throat> if you go to Hebrews 9, Hebrews 9 and the New International Version says Christ entered into the most holy place, the entire chapter. And <clears throat> uh, my father-in-law has written a nice paper showing that the correct translation of the word tahagia is holy places which means holy place and most holy place in the entire chapter of Hebrews 9 and the one translation that really mutilates the Okay, so that's on the Desmond Ford Apostasy, a lecture by Norman McNulty. You can uh, find it on YouTube. Translation of that is the New International Version, but that's what Desmond Ford used to prove his point. Number six, he says the Bible teaches neither a two-apartment heavenly sanctuary nor a two-phased ministry by Jesus in heaven. <clears throat> Once again, Hebrews 9 says that the sanctuary is, that Moses made is a, was a pattern after the one in heaven. How much clearer do you need to get? I mean, now you start to wonder if he's being intentionally dishonest. Number seven, the phrase within the veil in the book of Hebrews refers to the second veil or entrance into the most holy place. Once again, there's two veils. There's the veil into the holy place and the veil into the most holy place. Let's just use some common sense here. Um, number eight, he says, Seventh-day Adventists are wrong in teaching that sacrificial blood defiled the sanctuary either on earth or in heaven. And that kind of could twist some people up, but let's think about this here. The blood that defiled the sanctuary was the blood that was um, from the sacrifices of the sins of God's people. And Ellen White makes a comment about this point. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, page 266. She says, As the sins of the people were anciently transferred and figure to the earthly sanctuary by the blood of the sin offering, so are sins, in fact, transferred to the heavenly sanctuary by the blood of Christ. And as a typical cleansing of the earthly... Was okay, that's uh, enough for the moment on the Desmond Ford apostasy. So I thought I'd, uh, I'd show you my, my mother's book. This is uh, Fireside Stories by Gwen Ford. So 
It's published by Seventh-day Adventist Publisher, Southern Publishing Association, Nashville, Tennessee, copyright 1968. So it's divided into sections. It's a Christian book for children. Uh, part one, Adventures Far Away, Wun Ping, The Unwanted, uh, How Antonio Lost a Leg. So uh, let's look at uh, how Antonio lost a leg. All right, this is by my mother. Antonio lived in Peru. Remember that saying, use what language you will. You can never say anything but what you are. So I'm going to reconnect with my mother by reconnecting with her words. Antonio lived in Peru. He was a tall, handsome Indian, well-liked by all his friends. Antonio had only one leg, but this did not stop him from doing almost as much work as his Indian neighbors. I think it means Native American neighbors. By using a simple crutch to help him walk, he was able to take care of his fields. He would go on long hunting expeditions across swift flowing streams and down dangerous jungle paths. When harvest time came, he went off with the other men and returned, like them, with a large bundle of coffee on his back. At the mission station in Sandia, Peru, Antonio often attended Christian meetings. The missionary there wondered why this fine, healthy young man had only one leg. One day he learned the story. Once, when Antonio was just a little boy, he went walking through the jungle with his father. The path was rough and narrow, and the father went on ahead so he could clear the way in front of them. He cut down the thick undergrowth with his machete, a big jungle, jungle knife. They were miles from any village, and the sun seemed to get hotter and hotter as they trudged along, father with his big bundle and Antonio with his smaller one. Then, unexpectedly, trouble came. Daddy, daddy, wailed little Antonio, it bit me. Quickly, father looked down and saw a venomous snake slithering through the grass. One look at the fang marks on Antonio's leg as he squatted there by the path, and the father knew for sure that the deadly snake had bitten his son. What should he do now? The question raced through the father's mind. It would take days to reach the nearest doctor. By that time, poor little Antonio would be dead. In fact, it would only take a few hours for that snake venom to kill his boy. The father looked at his machete. It was blunt, and he knew he couldn't do the job with a single stroke. But if he was to save Antonio's life, he must cut off his leg above the bite. It was no easy job. There was no anesthetic to deaden the pain. And the father shook with fright as he picked up his machete, but he did it and saved Antonio's life. Long ago, all of us were bitten by that old serpent, Satan. Our heavenly father was sad too, because we would ultimately die. He did the only thing he could do to save us, though it cost him much. He sent his son to share our human nature and risk losing him forever so that by his death, we might be healed and really live again. Okay, book of uh, Christian children's stories by my mother called Fireside Stories. Okay, so this is a terrific biography of my father. You can find it online for about 25 bucks. Uh, Desmond Ford, reformist, theologian, gospel revivalist. So I'll show you some pictures of my, my dad and my mom. Okay, so this is my mom here. And then uh, this is my father and my mother on their wedding day in 1952. And then uh, more photos of my father and mother in the 1950s. And uh, I'm the baby here in this photo. It'd be really hard to see. It's my family in the 1960s. <laughs> and then uh, this is my father. And with my stepmother, and there's me in the 1970s. And then uh, this is my father in the 
or my father in the 1970s. Then uh, my father in 1980s, 1990s. Okay. So we're talking about uh, the the head of the local Australasian division was David Sibley, and he is a character in the terrific film about growing up Seventh-day Adventist in Australia called The Nostradamus Kid, which I strongly recommend, and I believe you can find it on YouTube. So David Sibley could make the promise of a soul charge pastorate for 1953 because he knew of Desmond's planned wedding at the end of 1952. It was the accepted norm that a pastor working with limited supervision should be married to bring certain checks and balances to his ministry. This development was made easier when Desmond's mother tired of caravanning and its privations. So my father's mother would always insist on traveling with him and being with him as much as possible until she got tired of it. Desmond had explained to Gwen, my mother, that marriage would mean she would have to tolerate the presence and financial burden of his mother in their home. Oh, what a joy. So my father's mother was a whack job, very selfish, narcissistic woman, kind of like her grandson, uh, sex and love addict, chasing men, satiable for attention and admiration, uh, just uh, didn't, didn't have many friends. Gwen was graciously resigned to the fact of Lillian making up a threesome. But by now, Lillian had had enough of New South Wales towns, especially the wintry conditions. Northern Queensland had lured her back home. She would, in the future, only visit once a year to maintain her maternal rights, as Desmond Riley stated later. Yeah, I remember she would come stay with us uh, once a year, and uh, none of us were particularly looking forward to it. <laughs> Throughout 1952, the letters between Gwen and Desmond reflected an increasing frenzy about wedding plans. Both were stretched in their duties with their minds on numerous urgencies. There was indecision about the caterer for the reception. The color of the suits Desmond and his best man should wear was debated. They were uncertain about finding time to buy Gwen's wedding ring. So that's controversial because in Seventh-day Adventism, it's an aesthetic religion, ascetic, aesthetic. It's more ascetic than aesthetic. And uh, the religion frowns on the wearing of jewelry even by traditional Adventists, they frown on the wearing of a woman wearing a wedding ring. Orthodox Jewish men, by and large, do not wear wedding rings. They mold over the choice of a minister to perform the service and where the ceremony should take place, Sydney or Kurumbong. And initially, there was a misunderstanding over whether they should have one bridesmaid or two. Some things were certain. Based on Ellen White's writings, they determined that there would be no ostentation at their wedding. So Seventh-day Adventists do not tend to be ostentatious. Some things were certain, right? No ostentation. And a large sum of money was not going to be spent on photographs. So that's uh, First Testimonies, page 500 from Ellen White. And no ostentation at the wedding. That's Four Testimonies, page 515. That... White also forbade wedding rings in testimonies to ministers, pages 180 to 181, was usually ignored by Australians. Cultural expectation of a bride receiving a ring being stronger than in America. Desmond and Gwen therefore followed Australian custom, the bridegroom placing a ring on the bride's hand during the wedding service. Gwen planned meticulously for the grand day. Early in November, Desmond himself was Finally able to get to Kurumbong and Sydney to make final preparations in the space of a day or two, the date and venue were settled. Invitation cards printed and posted and the wedding ring purchased. Doug Martin, a personal friend, was chosen to sing during the service. Desmond and Gwen, my parents were wed on Wednesday, December 17, 1952. So my father would have been about 32, 22 father would have been 22 years of age. I am more than twice that age, still never married. They were wedded in the Avondale College Chapel. I believe you can see that in one of the final scenes in the Meryl Streep movie, A Cry in the Dark, about Michael and 
Lindy Chamberlain. A place of hallowed sentiment for many college students. The celebrant was Desmond's mentor, Dr. Murdoch. He was about to leave Australia and take up a new appointment as a lecturer at the SDA seminary in Washington, DC. Not many Queensland relatives were able to travel the long distance to attend the wedding. So growing up and into long into adulthood, I always had trouble uh, remembering what an uncle was, what a niece was, what a cousin was, because I had that little contact with my relatives growing up, large part because my parents converted to this wacko religion. That's how Australians, by and large, view Seventh-day Adventists. And so I didn't have much contact with my relatives. I was kind of shaky on what an aunt was or an uncle. Des's mother and Gwen's parents and sister Linda traveled south to be there. All of my grandparents died at around age 87. Then my dad died at age 90 and my mother died at age 40. Uh, more relatives sent gifts and good wishes. Most of the guests were from Sydney and the Kurumbong district, including Alfred Kranz and his wife. Gwen's devoted school children sent a water set, a crystal set, and a silver tray. Church members at Coffs Harbour had previously showered them with kitchen electrical goods and a set of cutlery. So I went to Loma Linda University in 2010, and I stayed with a woman who had uh, cared for my mother in her final months of life. In wedded bliss, Des and Gwen set out for Wollongong on their honeymoon. Any of you been to Wollongong? In a flyver, a 1929 Chevrolet Tourer. That's what they drove. <laughs> My dad was always driving old, old cars, and he always had a great fear of them because he wasn't at all mechanical, and they were always breaking down. Uh, My parents didn't get a new car, I think, until... 1980 was the first time my family ever had a new car. Desert earlier crashed it on the way to a Bible study, rolling the vehicle over about four times on a rough and sloping mountain track near Megan, scattering his suitcase tools and prophetic charts all down the hillside. The windshield was smashed, the hood turned, torn off, and the two wheels were badly buckled. Fortunately, when it came to rest, he was still in the car with only bruises and small cuts. He scrambled out and walked to the nearby farmhouse, gave his Bible study, and then his friends hauled the car into town. Despite repairs, it never ran as well again. <laughs> Makeshift gadgets such as a bath plug and a string to act as a choke spoke of desperate measures to keep it going. It became so unreliable and embarrassing, he often chose to hitchhike to appointments. However, it gave little trouble during their honeymoon. In their first year together, 1953, Des and Gwen were assigned to the Quirindi Pastorate in northern New South Wales. Des conducted an evangelistic campaign in the local sports pavilion. So what uh, sports are to most Australians, Christian evangelism is to Seventh-day Adventists. His college friends, Alan Probert and his wife, Beryl, assisted with the music. Fords lived in a caravan and Probert's in an old schoolhouse, all on church property. Des stored his growing library in a tumble-down shed on site. So my father always loved his library, and uh, he had thousands and thousands of books. When I was converting to Judaism, I'd wander around in his library looking for books on Judaism, found a handful. For the following 18 months, 1954 to mid-1955, Des was appointed to minister further west at Gunadar. On arrival, he held evangelistic meetings in the small town hall, rousing some mild opposition from the local Baptist minister who published a disclaimer saying, Baptist church is not in any way connected with the meetings at present being conducted by Mr. Desmond Ford. Des Moday and his wife Shirley billed as the musical Modays, held for most of the period in this country town. Anyone ever heard of the musical Modays? They were like the Britney Spears of 1950s. New South Wales Seventh-day Adventism. During those months, appointments were extended and even further west to the farthing communities of Narabri and Wiwa, 
where a few isolated Adventists live. So by and large, Seventh-day Adventists and Jews live in very different areas. So Jews live in Beverly Hills and Manhattan. Uh, Seventh-day Adventists live in San Bernardino. So uh, I'd say on average, uh, household income for American Jews is probably three times what it is for American Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, Seventh-day Adventists are more racially diverse than America as a whole, meaning Adventists in America. An elderly member at Narabri, Mrs. Wyatt, would give Des a room overnight, and then she would drive him to Weewa in her little Austin 7. There, Dr. Ludovici, an Adventist physician, hosted Des while he conducted an evangelistic crusade in the town school of arts. Advertising for these crusade meetings showed a different approach than did Burnside's posters, especially with regard to the topics of Armageddon and Russia in prophecy. After the meetings, Des would quickly travel back home by train for further speaking engagements. In mid-1955, Des and Gwen moved farther north in New South Wales to Inverell, remaining there until the end of 1957. This is nine years off before I'm born. Des launched into another public crusade with Butler Hall in the town center of the venue. He was kept busy preaching and giving Bible studies, conducting an evangelistic radio program and teaching scripture classes in the local high school. Government school regulations permitted clerics to voluntarily conduct a weekly class of their own denominational children and any others who chose to attend. While Des was occupied with his duties, Gwen bravely tried some Cole Porter work, having some success despite her timidity. Cole Porter walk is, work is where you go door to door trying to sell Seventh-day Adventist tracts and books. It's not easy. It's a little bit like uh, being a, a Chabad, Chabadnik and uh, going around asking people if they're Jewish and if they're men, have they put on to fill on today? Still ringing in Dez's ears were the words, you should go to the seminary, spoken by Dr. Murdoch some years earlier. Both he and Gwen were convinced they should plan for further study overseas, but how would they ever raise the finance? They deliberately spent little on furniture during their first years of marriage, but they found themselves repeatedly paying for repairs to their troublesome car. Yeah, I've had cars too that were a money pet, just like my dad. Some of their resources were devoted to the support of Dez's mother. No matter how frugally they lived, the meager ministerial salary was sorely tested. Seventh-day Adventist clergy are not well paid. No clear avenue for study overseas was evident. 1955, a move by some church administrators had almost changed Des's career path. Members of the Central Pacific Union Mission Executive requested he be appointed to their field. However, the top body, the Australasian Union Conference, advised the committee that they prefer he remain in homeland evangelism, effectively sinking any plans. Retrospect, it appears the continuance of Desmond's ministry in Australia hastened his prospects for study at the seminary. So Central Pacific Union, I wonder if that means uh, Pacific Union College in the Napa Valley, which was where I had some of the happiest years of my life. So a question from the chat, was the reading about Russia by Edgar Cayce? I don't know. But uh, traditional Seventh-day Adventism is all about the time of the end, apocalyptic, eschatology, uh, prophecy, that the king of the north will move here and there'll be a battle there and then the believers will have to flee to the mountains and then they'll be tracked down by the Catholics and the, the state and then Jesus will come back and save his chosen ones, his truly chosen ones, the, the Seventh-day Adventists. The Ford-Bergen debate. One of the things that my father loved doing, probably until his testosterone started declining in his 60s, but uh, up until his 60s, my father always loved a good debate. It wasn't, it wasn't until my dad got into his 60s that I, I noticed that there was some decline in his vitality and energy level. Up through his 60s, he was running four, four miles a day. Desert's stay at Inverell established his future. First, it was at this time he was ordained as a Seventh-day Adventist minister. Second, in 1955, he engaged in a public debate with a Church of Christ minister, Pastor Bergen, over the Sabbath issue, and it brought some kudos for Des. 
Bergen, a formidable opponent of Seventh-day Adventists, was accustomed to debating with Adventist ministers on the Sabbath issue. With the local Church of Christ Jubilee imminent, came known that Bergen would visit the celebrations. Some townsfolk saw an opportunity for a debate and let it be known to Des. For a month, Des pondered the prospects. He obtained a copy of a Bergen diatribe against Burnside and studied the contents closely. An old SDA classic by J.N. Andrews, The History of the Sabbath, was also probed and searched at length, presenting him with a number of fresh lines of argument. It became so intense it was hard to get to sleep at night. He worried that if such a debate were to be lost, it would bring discouragement to his flock and he himself would lose credibility as an Adventist pastor. I know around year 2000, so my father then would have been 70, he was still doing the occasional uh, public debate with uh, this atheist professor in the Sacramento area. All right, let me play a little of uh, Norm McNulty here, traditional Seventh-day Adventist, and uh, this is on the Desmond Ford apostasy. Norman McNulty. The sense by which it had been polluted, so the actual cleansing of the heavenly is accomplished by the removal or blotting out of the sins which are there recorded. So now Ellen White's obviously countering what Desmond Ford's saying, so guess what we do next? Number nine, the writings of Ellen White have no rightful authority in settling doctrinal controversy within the church. So who are you going to go with, Desmond Ford or Ellen White? Take your pick, because he's making you choose. Go with him and the scholars, or go with Ellen White, who um, received light from God. And then number 10, the sanctuary doctrine as historically taught by Seventh-day Adventists contradicts the New Testament gospel of grace. So there you have it. What's the connection between questions on doctrine and Desmond Ford? Desmond Ford says the sanctuary doctrine as historically taught by Seventh-day Adventists contradicts the New Testament gospel of grace. Well, questions on doctrine validates Desmond Ford's New Testament gospel of grace as he defines it. And it goes against the sanctuary doctrine. And you know what? Desmond Ford's absolutely right. The way he defines the gospel and the way questions on doctrine defines the gospel would be in contradiction to the sanctuary message. And you may say, well, what do you... Okay, that's... Uh video on YouTube, the Desmond Ford apostasy. As soon as Bergen arrived in town, he began preaching against Seventh-day Adventists, throwing down the gauntlet for anyone to prove that the Sabbath was instituted at creation. Des resolved he would accept the challenge and try to arrange the debate in a private home. As expected, Des was invited to the Church of Christ celebrations, and it was there that he first met Bergen. Predictably, Bergen said to him, I would like to have a public debate with you. Fine, said Des, let's have it every day for a month. No, replied Bergen, that would be unnecessary. What about every day for a week, Des offered. No, Bergen insisted, that's still too long. Would an all-day debate be adequate, Des finally asked. No, just one evening would be quite sufficient, Bergen concluded. It was first agreed to to conduct the meeting in a private home, but the Church of Christ members insisted on a public meeting. They set the topic, is the Bible, is the Sabbath binding on Christians? Des agreed to the change venue, but wanted a more biblical title. Bergen suggested the qualified title is the Old Testament Sabbath binding on Christians. On the spur of the moment, Des agreed, but Gwen persuaded him the wording was biased against him, so he renegotiated the title. After some haggling, final consent was reached with the wording, is the seventh day or the first day binding on Christians? A couple of weeks before the appointed time, October 11, Des began advertising the debate. Harold Hollingsworth, his newly elected conference president, was informed and invited, along with other church officials. There were many prayer sessions. Des tried to relieve his stress by cycling and walking with Alex Moi, best man at his wedding, and now his highly valued assistant in the ministry. Alex advised Des at the time, remember, it's not what you say, but the spirit in which you say it. On the day of the debate, Des and Gwen had breakfast out in the sunshine, as was their custom, and he secluded himself in the hills near his home. He walked, rehearsed arguments in his mind, prayed, and meditated. A packed hall greeted both speakers in the evening, including representatives from other Christian churches. So the chat says, I'd like to see video of the debate of my father with the atheist professor. Audio would be good too. Pretty sure you can find it 
at goodnewsunlimited.org, my father's uh, organization. Bergen made the first presentation, but hardly, scarcely said three words before Des touched him on the shoulder and suggested the meeting should begin with prayer. The initiative immediately placed Des in a favorable position with the audience. <laughs> There's my dad's debating tactics. Bergen put forward his usual objections, and Des meet him, met him at every turn with arguments that transcended the usual Adventist approach. Then Bergen resorted to sarcasm, losing further ground with the crowd. I'm sure, this is all based on my father's memory. Increasingly, his mouth and eyes twitched uncontrollably as he realized proceedings were slipping from his command. For the first time in his experience, he was really befuddled. At the close, Des shook hands with him. Bergen did not wait around. His loyal church members, however, believed he had gained the upper hand. SDA members left the hall, declaring their man had won the battle. Telegram was sent to head office saying Ford slew the dragon. They replied, congratulations, slaying dragon when funeral. Immediately after the meeting, Des and Alex walked for hours, arriving home about 1 a.m., 1 a.m., four hours past my father's usual bedtime. Following days, Des spent cycling and gardening to revive his energy. Twice he tried listening to the tape recording of the debate, but he found it too exciting. It only stressed him further. The proceedings did no harm to the SDA cause, and later Des baptized some of Bergen's church members. So, yeah, victory for my father. Sibley was so impressed that he had no qualms about recommending Des as a college Bible lecturer of the future, the long-term goal on which Des was focused. Even Burnside circulated eight pages of extracts from the debate. The Ford family grows. Gwen was well advanced in pregnancy at the time of the debate. She had the option of remaining at Inverell and being admitted to the nearest hospital just prior to the birth, but instead she chose to fly to Sydney to be close to the Adventist Sanitarium and Hospital. This proved to be providential. It's not usual that people uh, fly, right, when they're eight, nine months pregnant. In those days, there were no special leave provisions for evangelists, so Des was expected to carry on as normal. His public meetings were still in progress and church services, Bible studies, baptisms, and funerals filled his calendar. So my father, usually put his Christian ministry first. He was very clear about that. He was a dutiful father, but uh, his, his Christian ministry did come first. Gwen's labor pains had already begun when, not knowing her condition, Des scribbled a reassuring note. I'm praying for you constantly as you enter this short time of trouble. Scratching a few lines to Des in between contractions, she began, my dear husband Des and soon to be Papa. The time was far from short and crowded with trouble. The birth was a prolonged 34-hour ordeal. Dr. John Letham had to anesthetize her and use instruments because the babe was in the wrong position. Finally, soon after midday on Saturday, October 29, little Elaine Gwen entered her new world. That's my sister, big sister, mother and daughter. Had to remain in hospital for about three weeks. Des signed off in one of his letters. Your loving papa your loving husband, and now proud papa. Jamara says, Luke's morning meditations might be of greater value than a thousand ruminations. Uh, speaking is therapy, but the history says more. With Gwen out of danger and recuperating in the hospital, Des and his assistant, Alex, snatched a three-day camping trip. Uh, my father always enjoyed uh, going off camping because then other people couldn't get at him. This was before there were cell phones. He got to be on his own or with just his family. I remember some Saturday mornings we'd skip church and uh, get on the back of the bike and my father would cycle out to this quarry so he could just be alone. Uh, my father often said that Jean-Paul Sartre saying, hell is other people. The pressures of the year were causing Des to experience floating specks before his eyes. So my father's always a stronger man than me. He was able to study longer, harder, uh, accomplish more, bear up more, uh, deal with more strain and pressure. And uh, I wanted to excel my father for a long time. That was important to me to go to more prestigious universities than my father. 
accomplish greater things than my father. But uh, when I tried to take that on, I cracked, I broke, and spent most of my 20s in bed with uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. So my father was always pushing things to the limit of his vitality, which was immense compared to uh, my rather weak physical state. My father desperately needed a break. They gathered some essential supplies and motored south of the Bundara region, camping in a large outcrop of rocks with the wallabies and kangaroos nearby. They took long hikes during the day and rested by the river on their return. Des had baked four puddings to bring with him, made, he explained, from rice, milk, eggs, sultanas, salt, honey, and coconut, and an ant or two from the honey. When Gwen returned with Elaine, Des was called away to conduct eight meetings at the annual church camp, but he could not free his mind from his precious ones back home. With fun lines, he told Gwen, I'm glad you have her, Len, with you, for she represents us both. Neither of us is far away when she is about. So my father was always a pretty good cook. The, the food didn't look that good, but uh, tasted pretty good, and it was very healthy. While Des was at Inverell in New South Wales, Australia, some theological jousting was spearheaded by Robert Grieve, then president of the North New Zealand Conference, who was making a vocal stand against perfectionism in the Adventist church. He was also taking a step or two away from literalism, disavowing a two-apartment sanctuary in heaven and teaching that no record of sin is kept by God after a person has confessed and is justified by faith. Grieve's chief antagonist was Francis Clifford, president of the Australasian Division, who maintained that a belief in the sinful nature of Christ was the orthodox denominational position. Grieve, on the contrary, was preaching that Christ possessed a sinless nature during his incarnation. So this is one of the major theological arguments that I remember from my Seventh-day Adventist upbringing. At the time, Grieve was corresponding with Roy Allen Anderson in the ministerial department of the General Conference, found that Anderson, on studying the issue for himself, had recently arrived at similar conclusions. Anderson was in the midst of co-authoring the book Questions on Doctrine. This is a, an important Seventh-day Adventist uh, statement of systematic theology. With two colleagues at General Conference headquarters in Tacoma, Washington, D.C. Published the following year, it advocated, among other controversial topics, the sinless nature of Christ. The authors were optimistic about weaning the Seventh-day Adventist church away from its fundamentalism. So Seventh-day Adventist was founded and driven forward by people generally lacking in university educations. But uh, Seventh-day Adventists tend to last about three generations. The first generation tends to lack education, embraces the traditional apocalyptic, eschatological, distinctive Seventh-day Adventism, then their children benefit from a good Seventh-day Adventist education and go on to get uh, university educations and uh, become more liberal Seventh-day Adventists than their parents, because in part they, they went to secular universities, and then their kids tend to drop out of the church altogether. So typically there's like three generations in the Seventh-day Adventist story. But after the book's publication, they were stunned by the vitriol from church fundamentalists such as Millian Andreessen. However, the view regarding the sinless nature of Christ gathered support among some leading administrators in America. Okay, so in, in a struggle between the fundamentalists who hold that the church is the, the final, the, the latest divine revelation to the world, and that the church has a unique, distinctive uh, mission, that it is special, that it is essentially God's chosen people, and those who advocate a more liberal approach, the fundamentalists will always win out in that kind of battle. Because the fundamentalists saying, you know, we have divine truth, we can articulate God's uh, latest revelation to humanity, and they're going to be willing to sacrifice more for their church and for their beliefs. Uh, liberal Seventh-day Adventists and ev evangelical Seventh-day Adventists are not going to be willing to sacrifice as much for the Seventh-day Adventist church because they don't believe in its, uh, that it's essentially God's chosen church. And so 
those who are willing to sacrifice more will punch above their weight and have more influence. So traditional Adventists will win out in the end. And you see this happening again and again. Clifford was silenced by this turn of events, but by then it was too late for Grieve and three other ministers because they had all been defrocked for their stand on a raft of issues. So it is, uh, okay, I'm going to skip, skip down. Sibley, conference president and one who had seen Fletcher sacked for his views. So Fletcher was a major Seventh-day Adventist intellectual who was thrown out of the church for being a heretic. Uh, Sibley astounded Des one day by blurting out in the course of conversation, Fletcher was right. Sibley explained that never had been a church group without error, including SDAs, but they can all be a blessing to others nonetheless. Uh, Sibley was obliged to make an effort to counter grieve, and he enlisted Des to conduct a series of meetings in Brisbane for that purpose. Pray for me amid the controversy Des wrote home to Gwen, my mother. Central to Greaves' thesis was the rejection of a belief in a literal sanctuary in heaven. Okay, this teaching amounted to heresy in the eyes of most Australian Seventh-day Adventist church administrators. Seventh-day Adventist orthodoxy had taught that the first three festivals of the Jewish annual calendar, Passover, uh, Pentecost, uh, and... Uh, Pentecost is Sukkot, unleavened bread is Shavuot, were fulfilled in the first Christian century, the fulfillment of the last three festivals, trumpets, what's trumpets? Oh, that's Rosh Hashanah, Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and Tabernacles, that's Sukkot. Uh, they claim were postponed until the Millerite preaching that trumpeted 1844, followed by the investigative judgment bringing final atonement and then eternity in the new earth when Christ would tabernacle with the saints. Okay, I'm going to skip over these fine points of Seventh-day Adventist theology. And uh, while I find my place, I'll just go back to Norm McNulty speaking here on the Desmond Ford apostasy. Here's what Desmond Ford said about the gospel. Desmond Ford said, we, and, the, and this is what Questions on Doctrine introduced into Adventist theology for the first time. This is Catholic doctrine. It's called original sin. And this concept is that when we are born, we are born under condemnation without any choice. Adventists did not teach that before. Adventists taught that we are born with a free will to choose to serve God or not to choose him. And because of our fallen nature, inevitably we choose to go against God. But we are not under condemnation for being bored born. Desmond Ford says, yes, we are under condemnation for being born. And why did QOD say, yes, we're under condemnation for being born? Because they were trying to be a peace Calvinist who believe in predestination, who also believe that you're under condemnation for being born. So that's the first point. Then, because we are born sinners under condemnation, the next obvious point is Christ. Okay, back to this terrific book on my father, Desmond Ford, reformist theologian, gospel revivalist, by Milton Hook, published by Adventist Today. And I believe you can still buy copies of it through Adventist Today. Throughout these years as an evangelist, Des continued to explore ways and means for further academic study. He was eager to fit himself for the task of college Bible teaching. His library continued to grow with the addition of more secondhand books. He completed correspondence courses with the SDA Home Study Institute in America, at times disagreeing with his tutors there. All his inquiries made it evident he would need to gain a master's degree at the SDA seminary, the prerequisite being a bachelor's degree then being offered at Avondale College. Finances were the stumbling block. He had scarcely three pennies in his piggy bank. So you can see why my father's face was uh, long etched with deep lines of worry. All obstacles to further study disappeared, however, by October 1957. Uh, the Avondale College and Australasian Division had voted to sponsor Des to groom him as a prospective Bible lecturer at Avondale. Des and Gwen were overjoyed. The barriers against advanced education had dramatically fallen over 
enabling them to return to Avondale for further study in the 1958 college year. While these happy prospects for advanced education were in the air, Des and Gwen were anticipating the birth of their second child. Once again, Gwen chose Sydney Sanitarium. The hospital went south about the same time Des attended Avondale College for summer school. Little Alain remained behind with a church family in Inverell. If the newborn should be another daughter, they would call her Grace. Paul was the name chosen for a boy. With the arrival of the annual Christmas holidays, Des had virtually severed his ties with all responsibilities at Inverell, was able to be closer to Gwen for the occasion. The birth progressed without complications, and a healthy boy was born on Friday, December 20th, 1957. They named him Paul Wesley. Now, this is my brother. He's an atheist. My brother doesn't have a religious inclination in his body. Back in Inverell, Alain proudly told her playmates, I have a baby brother. She accepted him without any feelings of rivalry and learned to love him dearly. During January 1958, the Ford family reunited and settled in at Kurumbong, preparing for the start of Des's regular college study program. Years of evangelism in rural towns of New South Wales had been rich with memorable experiences and had further developed his social and public speaking skills. These he took with him, refining and expanding them in the years ahead. Okay, chapter four, reaching an academic milestone. Ford was in his late twenties with a young family when the opportunity presented itself for him to do further study. The next three years of tertiary education for him were significant for shaping his future. He would forge lasting friendships with more academics and establish a solid foundation for an illustrious teaching and preaching career. Late in 1957, preparations for Des to attend the 1958 college year at Avondale were marked by two bits of trivia. One was his estimated family budget for his second stint of study at Avondale. Showed a significant proportion was allocated for regular contributions to his mother's support and 12.5% tithe payments, donations he habitually had made since marriage. It indicated he had a high sense of responsibility to his church and family, but the overall budget was a portent that Spartan living would persist. Payments to his mother became burdensome as she grew more demanding. Second, church committee approval for some financial assistance to Des was made at about the same time as Owen Gain requested money for his own theology training. So Owen Gain is still alive. His, his wife uh, died a couple of years ago. Owen Gain would become one of my father's uh, chief theological opponents in the church. Uh, Roy Gain, Owen's son, is a leading Seventh-day Adventist intellectual and a professor at Seventh-day Adventist uh, University in Berrien Springs, Michigan. And uh, Roy Gain did a PhD in Hebrew at UC Berkeley under Jacob Milgram. In year two, 2007, I think, I was uh, back at Pacific Union College, and I stopped by and saw Owen Gain and, and his wife. and. Uh, and I mentioned it to my father, and he said, well, why'd you see them? Because they were theological enemies of my father. So he didn't, he didn't say much. I said, well, because I'm friends with Roy and Connie. Uh, but he, 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 my father had a tremendous amount of shame about me converting to Orthodox Judaism, and uh, he, he was very concerned about anything that would affect his Christian ministry and affect his reputation and me consorting with his theological enemies caused him great worry. Des would forge lasting friendships with more academics and establish a solid foundation for an illustrious teaching and preaching career. Late in 1957, preparations for Des to attend the 1958 college year at Avondale were marked by two bits of trivia. I wonder if narcissism is genetic, because my my father's mother was a narcissist. Pretty sure my father was narcissistic. I have a lot of narcissistic traits as well. I wonder if there's a genetic component to narcissism. One was his estimated family budget for his second 
dent at uh, Avondale. Okay. Uh, Owen Gain was a young teacher at Avondale, aspiring to earn a Bachelor of Divinity degree from London University. On this occasion, his petition was turned down by the denomination, partly because finances could not stretch to include more trainees. Furthermore, church executives did not imagine there would be a need for more theology teachers at Avondale in the foreseeable future. Gain's hopes of returning to Avondale one day as a leading Bible teacher were effectively cut off at the pass. For three years, he persevered with his request, but was consistently refused. Final attempt brought a qualified promise of assistance, the proviso being that he would be obliged to accept any type of church work after completing his studies. A Bible teaching position at Avondale could not be guaranteed. His annoyance coupled with a Wesleyan fundamentalist perspective on salvation themes later developed into hostility toward Des and his gospel emphasis. And uh, what would, yeah, Sam Vakten, I enjoy his uh, videos on narcissism. What would happen if I became a Buddhist, a Hindu, or a Muslim? Uh, I, I can't imagine that my father would have been thrilled if I'd become any of those, but uh, I think converting to Orthodox Judaism was like the ultimate rejection of my father's theology. During the summer of 1957, 58, so the summer, this is Australia, that means December 57, January 58. Prior to the start of the college year, a seminary extension school was held on the Avondale campus. It was undertaken to hose down the theology debate stirred by Robert Grieve. Edward Heppenstall was the star lecturer. He was a friend of the family. But it did not prove to be a watershed ministerial understanding of the gospel. Uh, Des attended, plying Happenstall with more questions than anyone else in the class. He had earlier corresponded with Happenstall, but the classroom experiences initiated a close and durable friendship between the two men. For decades, they would exchange theological insights, not always agreeing, but mutually respecting each other's ideas. Uh, narcissism is more of a modeled repetitive action. Yeah, so I think I've certainly modeled my father in that regard. The summer school reminded Des of the elements of Greaves' debate over the sanctuary doctrine. At this time, Des and his family lived in Alton Road, Kurumbong. I think we were like 220 Alton Road. No, oh, this is different. I'm thinking of Curran's Road. That's where I grew up. Within walking distance of college classes, he found the location most distracting. His columns in the Signs of the Times, Seventh-day Adventist publication had brought him some repute and a constant passing parade of well-meaning theology hobbyists. Upward of a dozen each day would visit to ask questions or air some supposed new light. Yeah, so I remember this growing up. Uh, theological hobbyists were always stopping by the house to talk to my dad. That's why we didn't have a telephone. We didn't have a telephone at uh, Avondale College, and we didn't have one at Pacific Union College. But then people would just drive up <laughs> and drop in at any time. So finally, reluctantly, I think we got a telephone in 1978 for, for the first time. When I went to UCLA, uh, I, initially I didn't want to get a telephone. And so my roommate and I would just go down the hall to use this girl's telephone. And then after a few days or a couple of weeks, I realized how stupid this was. And I said, okay, let's, let's get that. Let's get that phone. Des could choose to be rude and summarily dismiss them, but that was against his nature. Instead, he frequently retreated to the woods with books and paper in hand or took a handful of memory cards rehearsing as he walked. So in the two months since my father died, I've been reading all these essays and memories of him, and uh, nobody remembers him as being nasty or rude or cruel or crude. Uh, there are no allegations of financial or sexual misconduct. I never remember any such allegations against my father. He lived a uh, pretty righteous life, unless you think that his theology was of the devil, which many traditional Adventists do. So then, however nice my dad was, it wouldn't, wouldn't matter much, right? While studying, Des taught an undergraduate unit titled The Life and Teachings of Jesus which helped to defray some of his expenses. Jeffrey Rosenhain, director of teacher training at Avondale, 
One day provided a critique of dad's, my father's teaching style. Des remembers him saying candidly, you talk too fast and you tend to answer your own questions before giving the students time to answer them. So that was a long, lifelong struggle for my father to not talk so fast and to not interrupt people. When people would say a few words, he thought he already had the question they were trying to ask and he'd break in with his answers. Father wasn't usually a great listener. It was the time in his life too when he took up jogging for aerobic exercise. He'd found walking and cycling to be beneficial, but now he started something more vigorous. For a man naturally inclined to book reading and sedentary habits, this development was against the grain and a product of deliberate willpower. He habitually rose to study at about 3 a.m. During the day, he would get as much fresh air and sunshine as possible and then retire early after a light meal, right on one occasion of a simple supper of prunes and oranges. There was balance in his eating habits. He was never a vegan. Reading health research articles convinced him of the need for essential fatty acids. For this reason, he included eggs and some milk in his diet. His intense application to pastoral work and study over the past seven years had brought on a fainting spell during a minister's meeting. And while sitting in a history exam prior to starting his 1958 study program, a similar low blood pressure attack almost overcame him. He pulled through with great difficulty. An SDA physician, Dr. Boyd, had challenged him by asking him, don't you believe the health message? Seventh-day Adventists are really into the health message. I watch my diet, Des lamely offered. Boyd warned, you will not survive much beyond 40 if you don't seriously initiate an exercise regime to balance your study. This was vital advice, and Des widely heeded it. So uh, chat says, aren't Muslims the bigger theological opponents? I don't remember my father talking much about Islam and Muslims. Very little that conversation in our house growing up. Didn't talk much in our house about the Jews either that we have because if he did he would be under condemnation and need a savior as well so if christ lived a sinless life and sinless nature that does not prove that human beings in this life can attain character perfection and in fact because we have a sinful nature that's under condemnation we are going to be sinning till jesus come which is what desmond ford taught and he said we sin thousands of times a day without even thinking it he says you know ellen white says perfect health requires perfect circulation therefore when you cross your legs you're sinning because you're cutting off your circulation that's actual stuff that Desmond Ford would say. Mm -hmm. So he was trying to prove, look, we cannot be perfect before Jesus comes. That will only come when we receive glorified bodies. So that's uh, Norman McNulty lecturing on the Desmond Ford apostasy, trying to get different sides on my father. My father's studies in 1958 brought him into contact with Robert Brinsmead for the first time. Brinsmead, that was a name constantly heard in my home growing up. They were classmates. Robert was invited home for meals with the Fords. I think one of the Brinsmeads uh, wanted to, to toughen up a uh, member of my family. So I think he, he made him uh, chop the heads off chickens or like kill some animals to toughen him up when he was just a lad. They were classmates. Robert was invited home for meals with the Fords. They walked and talked on bush hikes together. One of their classes was art under the tutelage of Morris Kennedy. As he and Brinsmead applied their doubtful artistic skills, much time was absorbed in theological discussion. Later, Des admitted Kennedy stretched the bounds of graciousness by giving him a pass in the subject. My father never had much interest in art. He did like the music of Wagner. The two students were unevenly matched in some respects. Des came with ministerial experience, wide reading in the evangelical classics and denominational literature, and a developing network of friends in SDA academia. Brinsmead, on the other hand, was a farm boy steeped in ultra-conservative Adventism and out of contact with the foremost thinkers in the church. Nevertheless, their differences were balanced by significant similarities. Both were earnest Christians, intensely loyal to their church, devotees of Ellen White's writings and keen debaters of topical issues with an infectious charisma that was persuasive when arguing their viewpoints. In mid-year, Brinsmead and Archibald Heffron, now 
a college lecturer, had a friendly public debate about the biblical covenants. Heffron took the traditional SDA view that there were two separate covenants. I'm going to skip the, the covenant stuff. Skip. Uh, Des found himself out of harmony with most of uh, Brinsmead's theology, but they remained friends. All that Des could do was recommend some more books that might broaden Brinsmead's understanding. My dad was always willing to recommend books to broaden people's understanding. In July 1958, Gwen and the two children went north to Tenham Sands. So that's where my mother's family, my mother's parents once owned Tenham Sands near Gladstone, Queensland, to be with her parents. And there are all these streets named after family members. There's Booth Avenue, which is their their name, my mother's maiden name. I think my brother has a nursery in Tenham Sands on Booth Avenue. There's uh, uh, Gwen, I think, has a street named after her, and uh, other, other members of my mother's family have streets named after them in Tenham Sands because their parents once owned all of Tenham Sands. Des advised Gwen, get all the peace, exercise, rest, and reading in that you can. This is a God-given opportunity for you to prepare for the next two or three years in a new atmosphere. So preparations were well underway for Des and his family to sail to America for more study. Four months of R&R &R for Gwen proved to be a real tonic. At the end of the college year, Des graduated with his Bachelor of Arts degree, serving as chaplain of his graduating class. Des and family boarded the Arcadia at Sydney on November 28, 1958. Their trip to New York took them via the Suez Canal, a longer route, but one that enabled Des to familiarize himself with places of interest that might arise in his Bible teaching. During the first stage of the journey, Paul was ill, and while crossing the infamous Great Australian Bight, both Des and Gwen became seasick. Family confined itself to the cabin for much of that time. Comfortable in the small space, festooned with freshly washed diapers hung to dry, they longed for Fremantle Harbour at Western Australia and a stretch on terra firma. At Fremantle, the ship made a one-day stopover. Des took the opportunity to visit the SDA College in the hills at Carmel. Later in Singapore, the family inspected a mosque and the war cemetery and bought some clothing at the street bazaars. Ship called in at Colombo and Aden before going through the Suez Canal. On board, they amused themselves in the swimming pool and at the ping pong table where Gwen especially excelled. Uh, my father is not particularly athletically gifted and neither are his kids. Traveling companions included an Anglican minister. They also struck up a conversation with a lady on her way as a missionary to Sudan. In Cairo, Des spent two hours in the Egyptian museum. He also made a hurried trip to the pyramids, dodging the street hawkers who were as thick as flies and much more persistent. When the ship reached Malta, Des disembarked, leaving his family to travel on to England. He wished to visit Pompeii, Rome, and the Ordensian Valley. Des found the SDA church in Rome. Its minister, a modern-day Jehu on a scooter, took him to many places of interest, including the catacombs and the Vatican Museum. Traveling through the Alps to Switzerland, Des was impressed by the beauty of the mountains. In France, he visited the SDA seminary at Collange. Giving Paris a miss, he pressed on to London, anxious to rejoin his family at Hull, where they were staying with Gwen's aunts. London proved to be packed with interest. For years, Des had bought books from a secondhand dealer in the metropolis. He searched the bookseller's shop and found a few more additions to his library, including some works by F.W. Borham, one of his favorite authors. He visited St. Paul's Cathedral, Westminster Abbey, and the British Museum, delighting in the sights of the Rosetta Stone, early biblical manuscripts, and Babylonian clay tablets that spoke of a great flood. Family reunited and met up with fellow Australian Eric Magnuson, who had just completed his second PhD, this one in chemistry. Two years later, Des and Eric found themselves lecturing together back at Avondale. They were lifelong friends, and uh, I became friends with uh, Eric Magnuson's boys, particularly the middle one, Roger. Before the boat left for America, Des and his family spent three days at Newbold SDA College. Des took a chapel service and conducted a Bible class session in public evangelism. With their meager earthly possessions bundled up in cardboard boxes and a borrowed trunk, 
They sailed from Tilbury Docks aboard the Saxonia on January 17, 1959. The Atlantic winter seas were so rough that Des and Gwen suffered seasickness. They were confined to their cabin, unable to read or write, and so weakened they could barely talk. The crew was ill too, but the children remained unaffected. Des and Gwen were glad to disembark on January 25 after two months of traveling. They asked about their accommodations near the Washington Seminary, but were told it was unavailable for another week. So a room was found for them at the New York SDA Evangelistic Center off Times Square. During their brief stay in New York, an SDA physician, Wayne McFarland, learned of little Paul's recurrent bronchitis. Kindly called at their room with a prescription and some American dollars to buy the medication. He advised too that they keep the air moist by boiling water on the stove all night. Paul soon made a complete recovery. William Murdoch, years earlier, had marked Ford as a man who should attend the SDA seminary, it's then in Washington, D.C. area. So he was especially pleased to welcome him that both Murdoch and Happenstall were lecturing there, and made Des feel at home. Des spent about 20 hours a week in classes and an equal amount of time in the library. Gwen herself completed three units, scoring top grades in each. They found that living expenses were higher than expected, so Des took a part-time job marking home Bible study answer sheets. Eppenstall in his classes based much of his material on Carl Henry's commentary, and Des enjoyed the insights. Anyone here ever have a job marking home Bible study answer sheets? Wonder how well that pays. A couple of teachers were disappointing, one spending most of the time discussing archaeological findings and chronology, but dodging the exegetical minefields in the book of Daniel. Another who taught church history from moldy old notes seemed to become lost in the minutia. With characteristic Aussie bluntness, Des said to the seminary dean, I wouldn't cross the road for some of your teachers here, let alone cross the world. Another influential lecturer, Earl Hilgert, exercised student minds in non-traditional views that were akin to those of the ousted Australian Bible teacher, William Fletcher. Des wrote a paper on Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27 for Hilgert, who promptly scribbled all over it, tearing his traditional arguments to shreds. Des had to face head-on these problems in the SDA viewpoint. Church academics were decades ahead of laity and administrators and the prevalence of unorthodoxy alarmed Des, pressing him to question, how can I return to Avondale and teach a raft of controversial issues? The thought troubled him for months. One day, while on his way home to Salisbury Hall near the seminary, he was overcome with a reassuring impression. It was as if a voice had whispered, it will be all right, Des. Later, on arriving back at Avondale, David Sibley's advice was more specific. Tell students the problems and give them the best answers you can. After two quarters of study, Heppenstall's assessment of Des suggested that he would be wasting his time to proceed there into the Bachelor of Divinity degree course. The seminary, euphemistically called Potomac University, was not offering an accredited degree. It would be wiser, Heppenstall believed, for Des to attend a university that offered an accredited doctorate. So let's Go back to the Desmond Ford apostasy. This is Norman McNulty. Christ is a sinless nature. We can't have character fiction. And then we are justified. Oh, or when we are justified, that's the only thing that saves us. Christ declares us righteous. And because we are sinners by nature, sinning all the time, we need Christ's righteousness to cover us because we're sinning all the time. But Christ in his mercy covers us, but we keep sinning, but it's the covering of his righteousness that will save us when he comes. Well, the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that we are made new creatures in Christ when we are justified. And it goes directly contrary to what Desmond Ford says. And then he says that sanctification or justification is 100% God's work, 0% man's. Sanctification is 50% man's work, 50% God's work, which I don't know where in the Bible it's. And the chat asks, how do I feel about the book of Daniel? I got so much of it growing up that I don't think I've opened it since age 16 or 17. So maybe I should read a Jewish commentary on, on the book of Daniel. 
That would be rich. Okay, so my father attended Michigan State University where Kenneth Hans lectured. Hans was a Christian closely associated with the SDAs and was considered tops in his field of expertise, the art of public speaking or homiletics. He had written the article on rhetoric for Encyclopedia Britannica and was president of the American Association for Speech. This is where my father honed his public speaking skills and rhetorical skills. Happenstall dashed off a letter to Gordon McDowell, now education director at Australian headquarters, imploring him in urgent tones. We are all impressed here by Ford's ability in every way. He stands out here at the seminary, head and shoulders almost above all others. He's taken some of the most basic theological courses here at the seminary. And in this area, he is ahead of some of the teachers to say the least. I hate to see Ford leave the seminary in one way. He's been the best student in my classes and I hate to lose good students. We are 50 years behind the time as far as university degrees are concerned, but it is a shame for men like Ford to spend all this time and not get a fully accredited degree when he is capable and can get it done. Des Ford is going to make the move. He must do it right away. In other words, he must move and get to Michigan for the fall quarter beginning early in September. So McDowell agreed and was galvanized into action. He phoned his friend Lawrence Naden, then secretary at the same office, persuading him of the emergency. Clifford was flying back to Sydney that evening from a Papua New Guinea visit. On the trip from the airport, Naden convinced him that an immediate decision was imperative. So the quorum of three, Clifford, Naden, and McDowell, met in Clifford's office about midnight and voted to authorize the transfer of Des to Michigan State University, then dispatched the message to America. The plans at the time were for Des to spend 18 months in coursework and complete his major research thesis and for him to return to Avondale to lecture in February 1961. Des and his family quickly relocated to East Lansing near the university and they began regularly attending the Lansing SDA church. The minister arrived for free furniture to be installed in their home, giving the Aussies a typically hospitable American welcome. Des and Gwen made good friends of many, especially three McCalmerys, a dentist, a doctor, and the wife of Art Klein. Des preached at Lansing and many more nearby churches so often that prior to his departure, the Michigan Conference Secretary sent him an unexpected check with hearty thanks. Des also kept in contact with Happenstall, who moved to Michigan. Happenstall had come with the seminary when it transferred to Berrien Springs, a short drive from Lansing. My mother Gwen took typing lessons one evening each week, and Des put his studies aside on those occasions and devoted his complete attention to his youngsters. What a great time we would have, Len remembers. He became our playground on those dark winter nights. We would climb all over him and ride on his back, and he would lift us up into the air on his feet. We would tumble and squeal with delight. So yeah, I remember a lot of uh, roughhousing with my dad growing up. I enjoyed that. As Des progressed through his coursework, he was able to incorporate some units related to religion, preparation for his major thesis. He included studies in ancient and medieval history, Christian literature, the Protestant Reformation, and religion in American culture. By burning the midnight oil, he also made giant strides with his major dissertation, a study of selected Pauline epistles as written addresses. So I read about half of my dad's PhD thesis wasn't terribly impressed. By the end of November 1960, he had completed that too ahead of schedule. On hearing the news, Happenstall congratulated him. Praise the Lord for his goodness. Yours is a marvelous achievement by the grace of God. When you first went there, I was hoping that all the class work could be completed. Never dreamed that your thesis too would be ready. There was one hiccup. There's found it irksome and he was asked by his professor to rewrite the first 50 pages before the final submission, honing it to perfection. It was a section treating the historical background for the thesis. On reflection, this was providential, Des believes, because it was probably the only section of his thesis read thoroughly years later by Frederick Bruce, F.F. Bruce, Manchester University lecturer, who was more of a historian than a theologian. Bruce favorably assessed his qualifications to enter a second doctoral program in England. 
Happenstall was eager to have Des join him at Andrews University and lecture in systematic theology after graduation, despite the reality of indenture to the Australasian field. Murdoch was less optimistic, knowing full well that McDowell was counting on Des to return to Avondale and would vigorously oppose the cancellation of plans. Let's go back to the Desmond Ford apostasy here with Norman McNulty. Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24 says God will sanctify us wholly or completely. So it's his work 100%. And Desmond Ford maybe didn't read that Bible verse. Um, so then when you get to all of that, then you say, well, if I'm born under condemnation and I'm not going to be perfect in this life and I can't really keep the law and it's Christ's righteousness that covers me, what's this whole point of an investigative judgment? Because the investigative judgment which is supposed to be every man judged according to his works. Well, according to this gospel, we're going to be sinning until Jesus comes. So in the investigative judgment. Okay, back to this terrific biography of my dad, Desmond Ford, reformist, theologian, gospel revivalist. Two weeks later, Heppenstall surrendered to the inevitable. Writing to Des, he admitted, it appears to me that once you get back to Australia, we will have considerable difficulty in getting you back again to America. That is the way it goes. Murdoch will not press the matter with your superiors in Australia. In the same letter was found a gift of cash for Des and Gwen. Heppenstall Riley teased. Now just don't say a thing about the enclosed. Buy yourself and your good wife anything you have in mind. I know your inclination to argument. But this is no time and no subject for your discussion. Stay on theology. Just keep your hat on. On December 12th, 1960, Des was granted his PhD summa cum laude. Of the 105 possible credit points, 97 of them were graded A, almost a perfect record. Well, going back, so apparently the first 50 pages of my father's thesis was so good that F.F. F. Bruce accepted him into a second doctoral program. So those, I read those pages, so I wasn't impressed with them, but F.F. F. Bruce was. Hmm. The 105 possible credit points, 97 of them were graded A, almost a perfect record. Heppenstall loaned him an academic gown for the ceremony to save the expense of renting one and wrote further to him, that you have completed this work so early in life will mean a great deal to you in the future. So 1960, so by age 31, my father had his, had his uh, PhD. And uh, my father would often talk about the strain of getting a PhD and how various other Seventh-day Adventist professors and intellectuals had, had taken them five years, 10 years. And father was always very proud that he got his PhDs in 18 months each. But uh, he'd often talk about how getting a PhD had ruined the health of this man or that man. And he had warned me about the strain on your health of doing a PhD from Heppenstall. Now you can spend your energies in your first love, the Bible and biblical theology. There is no doubt in my mind that with this degree, other doors will be open to you in the world. I've already spoken to Dr. Murdoch to urge that you be given a definite call to teach at the university, Andrews University. As soon as this is possible, he agrees with me, of course. You never know how long you are to be around, and there arises one who knows not Joseph. I have no doubt that in the next few years you will establish yourself as one of our top men in biblical theology. And with this, the financial obligation to your division will not be considered any obstacle to a transfer to America. For Des and his family, these three years of study were filled with privations and stress, but at the same time, it was an exhilarating experience. Des had easily earned academic qualifications to achieve what he wanted to do more than anything, to teach the scriptures to active, inquiring minds. His return to Avondale in 1961 is a full-time Bible lecturer, heralded momentous times in his career. That's the end of chapter four. That's all from me for now. Bye-bye.